As we come to the end of current gen, it's always good to look back at what this generation has become and all the amazing games it had to offer. Now 2020 has been a crazy year for gaming and that's all due to the current pandemic we've been in. We've seen so many games get pushed back, E3 getting completely cancelled, and a bunch of companies going completely digital when it comes to their services. But despite all these adversities, we've seen some pretty damn good games come out this year. And with next gen literally around the corner, or knowing me by the time the video comes out, next gen will probably be out, I can say gaming looks pretty good in the future. But when we talk about game of the year, there's one standout title that I really think takes that cake. A game that I actually went into with the lowest of expectations, but I was completely blown away by the end result. Created by Sucker Punch Studio, the same studio that brought you Sly Cooper and Infamous series comes Ghost of Tsushima. And it's hands down, one of the best titles I played this entire year. And I can say with my whole chest, this is game of the year. Taking place in the feudal era of Japan, Ghost of Tsushima takes you through the life as a samurai with an immersive world, stunning environments, and an intricate story. But how well does this pan out? Is a game really game of the year? Well, after taking me like 5 months to complete the game, I think I can confidently answer this question. Well, my name is Kwesi, and today, let's talk about Ghost of Tsushima. After the success of Infamous Second Light, the team at Sucker Punch really wanted to make a new open world game that incorporated player choices to the gameplay, kinda similar to the Infamous titles. According to Nate Fox, the director of Ghost of Tsushima, they wanted a game with no waypoints or HUD, so that players would have the freedom to explore the world and take in the sights. And boy did Ghost of Tsushima accomplish that. I'll admit it, when I first heard that in order to reach a destination you had to follow the wind, I thought it was like some kind of anime bullshit that developers doing just because of the Japanese game. But now that I've played it, I can admit the win system was pretty freaking awesome and plus it's one of the few games that actually use the PlayStation's touchpad. Did you know that originally the team wanted the game to revolve around pirates but Nate Fox was really interested in feudal Japan. He was specifically interested in the Mongol invasion of 1274 so the team instead went with that. Now the team really wanted to be as accurate as possible when it came down to the image of Tsushima Island. It was to a point where some of the developers actually visited the real island to get pictures to use for the final game. They also spent countless hours watching samurai films like Seven Samurai and Sanjiro. Now the team didn't only focus on the visual aspect of the game, the team went as far as to take a look at the audio. While at Tsushima Island, the team recorded sounds of waves, nature, and birds chirping so a lot of thought went into the creation of the world. But how effective were these tactics when it came down to the player experience? Well, it did a lot. So before we talk about the world, let's address the story. Ghost of Tsushima takes place during a Mongol invasion on the island of Tsushima. You play as Jin Sekai, the last member of the Sekai clan. He joins his uncle Lord Shimura and hundreds of samurais as they attack the Mongol army with the final attempt to rid the island of the invaders. The opening scene is one of the best I've seen in a while. It jumps you straight into the battle. And because there's no HUD to tell you where to go, you have to rely on your samurai teammates to kind of give you a sense of where to go. I also like how we get an idea of the type of people the samurai and the Mongols are. Lord Shimura sends one of his best warriors to face off against the leader of the Mongol army. However, instead of a one-on-one -on -one fair duel, the Khan sets the samurai on fire and chops his head off. This shocking scene showcases how the Mongols do things. They'll do anything to get the advantage on their enemy and they lack honor. But on the other hand, the samurai put honor above everything and sometimes they suffer because of this. The samurai end up doing a full on attack in charge of the Mongols but unfortunately they're overwhelmed and Lord Shimura is taken into custody. Jin manages to escape and is rescued by a thief by the name of Yuna. And once he's brought back to health, his journey begins to save his uncle and take down the Khan. The premise of the story isn't something to write home about. It's actually pretty simple. Just rescue your uncle from the bad guys. However, the journey is what the game is all about. I'll admit it, at first Jin feels like a generic semi-protagonist who does things honorably but as the story progresses he begins to question the concept around honor. The game gives you an option to assassinate the Mongols. Now I'm not sure but I did hear that the more you assassinate the further Jin strays away from his samurai code and it can possibly change the ending. As far as I can tell this isn't necessarily true but I did notice the more I assassinated I would get some flashbacks of Jin reminiscing on the samurai code that his uncle taught him. Jin himself does change a lot throughout the story, specifically in Act 2, which in my opinion is one of the most powerful acts. But I think the highlight of this game is the supporting cast. I really enjoyed the side quest, which we'll get into later, where we explore the other remaining samurai and their internal struggles. It gives us more of an insight of who Jin is as he talks to some of these characters and reflects on his relationship with them. Lastly, I want to talk about the big bad guy, the Khan. 
Honestly, I don't think that he's all that good of an antagonist, but he serves more as a foil for Jin. The Khan, of course, wants to conquer Tsushima, but he offers peace to the citizens if the samurai work with him. Of course, because of their honor and code, the samurai refuse. Even though he is one of the most powerful warriors of the Mongol army, he and his men resort to dirty tactics in order to defeat their enemies, and I feel like Jin understands that, and he comes to realization that the style of battle the samurai prefer won't be enough to defeat the Mongols. The only issue about the Khan is that we don't really see him a lot throughout the story. I wish they painted him as more of a villain, and we gotta see more of his villainous actions. Of course, I wanna keep the video spoiler free, but from my understanding, the Mongols were very similar to the Vikings, where they terrorized villages, stole food, and did all types of bad stuff, however, we never really see any of these things happen. We kinda just hear about it. Which is strange, given the fact that the game does not shy away from brutality. However, I do feel like that what we got was enough to understand how evil the Mongols are, and it was good enough to make me root for the samurai. Now let's talk about the ending. The ending of the story is pretty satisfying. I like the choices you have to make and how you can get different endings, depending on what you pick. But like I mentioned, it makes me believe that the way you play doesn't affect the ending at all, because the game lets you choose the ending. I wish that maybe depending on how many enemies you assassinate, the game would automatically choose the ending, kind of similar to the Infamous series. Nonetheless, the ending was still really good. And although I know a lot of people think a second game is on the way, I personally think Jin's story is over. Given the fact that if you wanted to, you could just liberate all of Tsushima, which of course I did. I feel like a DLC could give us some real closure, but an entire game following a new story, I don't know. I, I probably have to see what they would do. So if you play Sekiro, Neo, or any type of swordplay game, you will be very familiar with Ghost of Tsushima's gameplay style. It really takes many elements from a slew of game, but mixes it up in a way where the game still feels really unique. The game really boils down to sword stances that you have to use in order to give a jump on your enemies. There are four different stances, water, moon, stone, and wind. Each stance is super effective on one type of enemy. Wind is good on spear enemies, water is good on shield enemies, moon is good on brutes, and stone is good on swordsmen. Now at first it is hard to navigate through these stances, while at the same time trying to do a perfect block and attack, but as you practice more you begin to get the hang of it. And it's such an amazing feeling when you effectively clear out a group of enemies utilizing all your stances. Of course, the game doesn't start you off at all these stances, and because they throw all enemy types at you really early in the game, it's to your best interest to collect all the stances to help you out in battle. To collect all the stances, all you have to do is kill a Mongol leader inside one of the camps. The more Mongol leaders you kill, the quicker you get a stance. And it's not just the stances that can help you in battle, you also have ghost weapons such as kunai and sticky bombs, with the sticky bombs being one of my favorites. Now you only have a limited supply of the ghost weapons, so once you use them, they're all gone. You're gonna have to find more around the map, or you can buy some from the merchants. Of course, if you want to increase your inventory, you have to fight wild animals like boars and bears. And trust me, fighting bears are a pain in the ass. You also have a bow, dart gun, and grenades all at your disposal, and on top of that you also have your mystic techniques. The combat here is so diverse because if you actually don't want to fight anybody, you could sneak around the entire camp or around your enemies and assassinate everybody one by one. The choice is really yours here. And this is what makes the combat so addicting. Sometimes I will find myself riding around on my horse and see a group of mongols and just voluntarily fight them because I'm so addicted to the combat. Now let's quickly go back to something I mentioned earlier, the mystics. Mystics are basically techniques you can acquire from doing side quests of the same name. Now the interesting thing about this is how much story it adds into the world. You don't necessarily have to do this to progress the story, but it's highly encouraged and trust me, once you do your first one, you're gonna want to do the rest. Now what I like about them is that you typically have to talk to an NPC who will mention a rumor about a musician named Yamato. You would then take this rumor and go find Yamato and he'll begin to tell you the story about the mystic. I really like the artistic style that the stories are told in. And on top of that, the tales themselves are really fun to do and they always end up in some kind of duel of some sort. Also the duels are some of the best parts of this game. No ghost weapons, no bows, just skill. And these can sometimes be the most challenging part of the game, but learning your opponent's attack patterns and pulling off the perfect block is so refreshing. So that basically sums up the gameplay aspect, but how well does the world of Tsushima actually hold out? The first thing I have to say is that this game is freaking beautiful, and I'm playing on the original day one PS4. Now that my PS4 does sound like a freaking fighter jet, 
but the game runs so smooth it's crazy. It's strange because whenever I play games like Genshin Impact, my PS4 can barely hold a steady frame rate. But the colors, the wind, the atmosphere, and the music is so breathtaking. The subtle details that the game adds brings so much to the experience. It's the little things like how your clothes get dirty when you roll around the mud or how blood actually stays on your clothes after you get a kill. So much little details that make such a huge difference. There's also a lot to do within the world outside of the tales. Because the game doesn't give you a HUD, finding many of these hidden spots might be a little bit difficult. However, the game does have these yellow birds that if you follow them, they might lead you to something special. You might find a hot spring which allows you to reflect on Jin's life which in turn gives you more health. You might stumble across mats where you can sit and compose a poetic haiku and gain a headband. Birds aren't the only thing you can follow either. There are foxes scattered around the map that lead you to shrines where if you prey on them, you're rewarded with an extra slot for your charms. There are also shrines that require you to do a little bit of platforming to reach the top, but once you pray to them, they give you a rare charm. There is so much to do in the world that you can literally get carried away with the little things before you take on the main quest. And speaking of quests, I did mention the side missions, so let's talk about them. So basically the side quests are called Tales of Tsushima, where you take on quests from various different people all around the island. I honestly think that these quests are some of the best things about the game. However, the only downside is that some of these are actually pretty long. For example, one of them involving an archer by the name of Ishikawa is 9 parts long and you can only finish it once you hit Act 3. So yes, they can drag on for a long time, but on the other hand, the stories are really interesting. Sometimes I found a side quest story for some of the characters a little more interesting than the main story. But of course, not everything is perfect, so let's talk about some of the cons. In terms of bugs and glitches, there weren't a whole lot in the game, but there was one that I constantly kept running into and that was the floating glitch. Sometimes whenever you try to jump between rocks or climb up a certain surface, the game kind of won't let you in. Jin kind of floats in the air. Now if you're lucky, the game will restart you nearby, but sometimes you get stuck there, forcing you to reset your entire console. Now I haven't ran into it that often, but when I do, it's really annoying because it usually happens during battle. Also some of the side quests kind of get really repetitive. Typically it will go something like this. Someone was killed, you look for evidence, you find footprints, you follow them, you fight the bad guys. It wasn't every side quest that did this, but it was a good amount that did this and it even happened in some of the main quests too. Now it's not the biggest of deals, but it's really noticeable when you're doing them back to back and they constantly keep following this route. Also remember my first impression of the follow the wind system? Well, despite me being proven wrong and it actually working, it still had problems. There were certain parts of the story where the wind leads you to a certain area and you required to find something within the area. Sometimes these items are easy to find, but most of the time, you're going to be searching for like 15 to 20 minutes because the game refuses to point you into the right direction. This is the worst within the Mystic Tales, specifically the Underlying Flame, where you have to travel across a snowy mountain. Not so bad, right? Well, wrong. You have to do this while at the same time taking damage from the cold and you have to find a campfire in order to regain your health. I can't make this up. This took me hours to complete. Why? Because there's multiple ways you can enter the mountain but for some odd reason the game doesn't tell you which one is the best one. Every path I took I always ran into a dead end and by the time I found another path I would be dead. I typically don't like looking at walkthroughs or guides when I play games but I seriously had to consider doing it for this section of the game because of the lack of direction. Now that's really it for the cons, there wasn't too much I didn't like about the game, I really had to dig deep in my brain to find cons without really nitpicking too much. I can say the climbing mechanic was really buggy or how this game would really benefit with a lock on button, but these issues don't really interfere with the fun aspect of the game. All in all, I had a blast playing this game, and I can confidently say, despite all the flaws, this game is something I can recommend to anyone. When it's all said and done, Ghost of Tsushima is one of the most stunning story driven games I've ever played this year. It has some of the most exciting scenes, unexpected betrayal, and top notch swordplay I've ever gotten to experience. And when I say this, I really mean it, this game is definitely game of the year. It's been so long since the game really sucked me in that I dedicated my time to making sure I completed it. Typically with games like this, I play for a couple hours, put it down, and add it to my bucket list of games that I plan on to complete but Tsushima had me hooked in the minute I played it. Now of course, this video is really late given the fact that Tsushima has been out for like a couple months, but with Sucker Punch adding a multiplayer called Legends Mode, we can expect so much more coming in the near future, especially with next gen finally here. So what are your thoughts about Ghost of Tsushima? Did you enjoy the game when you played it? And also, do you think it's potentially game of the year? 
I would love to know everything you guys have to say down in the comment section down below. Of course, if you enjoyed the video, please leave a like. I worked so hard on this video and I'm pretty glad that I can finally have it out because I, boy, do I love Ghost of Tsushima. Also, if you're new here, make sure you hit the subscribe button. We did just hit 40 subscribers, so hopefully we can hit 100 by at least next year. Anyways, like always, my name is Quasi, and this was Just a Game.